it's September 11th, 2019. We love seeing a crowd here. We're always grateful when people are here to participate. So thank you for being here. Um, to start, I do I have an approval, or let's do approval of the minutes. Do I have a motion on that? So moved. I'll second. Okay, so uh, Weston uh, mo motioned and Brenda second. Thank you. Um, let's go Matt. Yes. <clears throat> Amy? Abstain. Uh, John? Abstain. Uh, Carolyn? Agree. Okay. Uh, Weston? Yes. Great. Brenda? Yes. And Adrian? Abstain. Thank you. All right. With one, two, three, four yeses, three abstain, it passes. Thank you. Um, I, so now a report. I have two things. First of all, welcome to John. John's new to our commission, so any commissioners, if you haven't met him yet, we'll do the hazing at the end. Um, <laughs> no, but thank you for joining us. Thank you for being here. And it is 9-11, so at the request of one of my fellow commissioners, I thought we could take a minute and just have a moment of silence. So if we can all do that. Okay, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Um, okay, so, and do we have a report uh, from the director? <clears throat> Nothing specific except for the item that's on the agenda, the time, uh, request for an extension of time um, for a plan development on 900 West. So we do have the applicant and the staff who worked on that project here, if the planning commission wants to ask any questions or discuss that. Can you just give a quick reason for the extension? Uh, you can ask the applicant for that. Okay, then let's do that. Let's pull up the um, <clears throat> staff and applicant. Mm -hmm. and the reason the reason for the extension is the... First, can we get your name, please? Yes, thank for the you. My name is Rod Ingar. Okay. I'm a general contractor and uh, developer and help assisting the owner of this project in developing and then building it for him as well. Great. Uh, he is a gentleman who is from out of the country and has done a good job of buying lots and building some homes and buying some <laughs> others and fixing them up and selling. And the reason for this extension is he has uh, two homes that he has had to get sold to raise the money to go ahead and, and complete this project. And so we're just waiting for one more sell and this extension will do that and give us a, a year now to go ahead and complete the construction of the project as well. So he's okay. prepared to do that, and so am I. All right, thanks. Matt, anything else? Okay. It's a one-year extension that we're extending it, I assume? It is a one-year extension. So if there are no more questions, does anyone want to make a motion? Madam Chairman, I move that the extension be accepted. Okay. So second. And a second by Matt. All right. So Carolyn... Um, made the motion, Matt seconded. Let's vote, same order. Matt? Yes. Amy? Yes. John? Yes. Carolyn? Agree. Weston? Yes. Brenda? Yes. And Adrian? Yes. Okay, unanimous, thank you very much. It passes. Thank you. Thank you. Can't wait to see it built. <laughs> okay, um, another reminder to anybody, if you want to participate in our meeting at all, we welcome that. We have these cards that are out right outside the door. If you can fill that out, um, it just it helps the meeting go a little faster. If you don't get it filled out, we'll still give you time, but it will make the meeting go a little slower. So if you can do that for us, that'd be great. Okay, let's go to the first item. Um, the AT&T wireless communication facility, conditional use. So, Sarah. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Thank you. So this is a proposal for an unmanned communication site with a monopole. The project is located on 5600 West, just south of California. The monopole will be located in the northwest corner of the site, and the primary use on the site is a large warehouse building. And then this image provides a broader context of the site. It's located about a half a mile north of SR201 and on the west side of 5600 West. And you can see California to the north. And the future Mountain View Corridor is located to the west. Here are a few photographs of the site. The photograph um, on the upper left shows the location approximately of where the monopole would be located. Um, to the right is the warehouse building that's to the south of the location. On the lower right is the view to the south west and then, I'm uh, sorry, the northwest of the parcel, and then on the lower right is the view to the southwest. So there's an elevation and site plan of the proposed monopole and then the communication site. And then there are two key considerations that were included in the staff report. The first are the visual and neighborhood impacts. The property is in the far western part of the city and it's near many industrial uses. The proposed monopole would provide additional connectivity for those nearby or for those traveling through the area, and I have not heard concerns from those that work or live in the area. And it's also located within the airport overlay, and the airport does not have concerns with the proposal. Additionally, it's located within the inland port, and all conditional uses in the inland port require planning commission review. Um, it does specifically exempt wireless communication facilities from the impact mitigation plan that's required for other uses. Um, and so based on this information, staff recommends approval of the proposed conditional use for the telecommunications facility and the monopole on the site. Are there questions for staff? Any questions for staff? Um, so the conditional use is because it's tall? It's because of the height of it. Right. Mm -hmm. So normally 60 foot, it would need to go here. Correct. Above 60 feet, it needs to have a conditional use. Okay. Anybody else? Um, is the applicant here? Come on up. Anywhere you want. Um, go ahead and have a seat. And uh, Sarah gave us a good overview, but if you have anything to add, you have 10 minutes. And please state your name for the record. So we've got that. My name is Doug Cawford. Doug? I work with a company called SmartLink. We do the real estate work for AT&T. Um, we were originally trying to co-locate on an existing tower about a quarter mile to the north. That property, is that my map? Yes. It's marked by the yellow arrow where the uh, monopole is located. Um, it's in a group of trailers and truck yard. We attempted to co-locate on that, but the lease that the tower owner has with the property owner required that we obtain additional ground space outside of the, their existing lease area. And we were unable to come to an agreement with the property owner to obtain additional ground. So that necessitated that we go out and find our own location. So we went over and talked to Landmark West about using their facility and uh, we're close to having the agreement consummated. Um, as soon as that's done and we have a building permit, we can go construct, but we need to have your approval for a conditional use permit. And I'm here to answer any questions that there might be. Great. Any questions for the applicant? Okay. None right now. Thank you. So we'll have you step back and we'll open the public hearing. And we may call you back up. So we'll open the public hearing. Is there anybody that is here to speak on this? Anybody from the community council? Anybody who's not on the community council? All right, we'll close the public hearing. Um, are there, at this point, are there additional questions for staff or the applicant? Or I'll take a motion. I'll go ahead and make a motion. <clears throat> Based on the findings listed in the staff report, the information presented, uh, and uh, the input received during the public hearing, I move that the Planning Commission approve the conditional use for the AT&T communication site with the 80-foot monopole and associated equipment, petition PLN PCM 2019-00542, subject to the following conditions listed in the uh, staff report. Second. Okay. 
Weston made motion, Adrian seconded. Let's, uh, is there anything else? Okay, then let's vote. Well, let's start with Adrian this time. Yes. Brenda? Yes. Uh, Weston? Yes. Carolyn? Agree. John? Yes. Amy? Yes. And Matt? Yes. Okay, unanimous. Thank you very much. You get your poll. Okay, let's move along. Uh, the next one is a design review at approximately 1485 South, 700 East. Sarah, that's also you, right? Thank you, as you stated, this is a design review for 1465 South, 700 East, and the request is for a reduction of um, approximately 12 feet of the 15-foot front yard setback for the construction of a canopy for outdoor dining. You can see in the image here the property outlined in yellow. It's located on the east side of 700 East and on the south side of Roosevelt Avenue. The property to the north is zone CN, and the other surrounding properties are zoned residential, and all of them are used for residential purposes. Um, this photo has a couple photos of the existing conditions on the site. The photo on the left shows the existing building and the view to the northeast, and then the photo on the right is the view across Roosevelt Avenue facing south. This is a proposed rendering of the building showing the canopy structure for outdoor dining and the canopy would be located on the west elevation facing 700 east. This is the proposed site plan for the project. There are to be three parking spaces on the site. Um, there was one site plan that was included with the staff report that showed a fourth parking space in the front yard setback that can't be permitted. Um, and the proposed canopy would be on the west elevation, again facing towards 700 east. There's also an addition to the building that's being approved through a separate process. Um, previously, the applicant received approval for an outdoor dining special exception, but the size and form of the canopy submitted in the building plans was such that it um, was in excess of what's permitted by the underlying zone, and so it's going through this design review process. These are the north and west elevations. On the north elevation, um, that's showing what faces Roosevelt, and you can see wood trim around the canopy. And then on the west elevation, there would be wood trim, brick columns, and then a gabion rock wall for the base. And then on the east and south elevations, these are the two sides that would face the residential properties. Um, the canopy wouldn't be visible from the east elevation. And then on um, the, I'm sorry, it would be, wouldn't be, would, Sorry, on the south elevation, it would be visible. You can see that there on the left, and then there, that would be wood trim similar to the north elevation. So there are three key considerations that were outlined in the staff report for the project. The first is the reduction in the front yard setback, which was discussed in detail in the staff report and in attachment H for the design review standards. Um, the proposed canopy meets the standards, um, including that it's oriented to the sidewalk. It will facilitate pedestrian interest, and since it's a small structure, it would be human scaled. As far as impacts to adjacent properties, the proposed use is permitted, and it complies with the parking requirements. The proposed canopy itself is oriented towards the street and pedestrians. It's oriented away from the adjacent residential uses. Um, staff has heard some concerns from neighbors regarding the parking and the proposed use. And there was additional email correspondence that was placed on the Dropbox on Monday um, with some emails from applicants. Um, as far as the third key consideration is compliance with master plans. Uh, it's consistent with Plan Salt Lake and the Central Community Master Plan. And the proposed restaurant's a small business and it would provide an additional gathering space in the neighborhood. Not sure how that happened. Um, so based on staff's review, staff recommends approval of the proposed design review for the reduction of approximately 12 feet of the 15-foot front yard setback, subject to the four conditions of approval on the slide. And then I wanted to note that there is that additional fourth condition of approval regarding the parking in the front yard. So are there questions for staff? Any questions at this point, Matt? This is a design review and not a conditional use review. Correct. And so in a context of a design review, the use that it extends or whether or not parking 
It's right. not we're, trying, we're not trying to mitigate impacts. Right. Right. We're just trying to make sure it Looking meets at the, the standards of the, of the design guidelines. Correct. So even though we're going to have this spot with three parking spots, and I'm sure, and I would understand the neighborhood's perspective, parking, though, is not really in this body's purview to be able to consider in this project. Exactly. The, the um, discussion is on the design review for the proposed canopy. <coughs> Was, okay, and so and, and it's not about mitigation of external. Historic. Correct. Thanks. So, Sarah, you um, referenced that that um, a canopy was approved, but that this was more than a canopy. Can you explain that? Sure. So, the special exception um, for that was approved for outdoor dining, which permits the outdoor dining in the CN district. And it would allow up to a two and a half foot canopy from that would project. And this was proposing to have the canopy project into the front yard about approximately 12 feet. And so that wasn't permitted um, based on the underlying zone requirements. So it wasn't about the, well, let's call it the heft of this particular proposal. Meaning, you know, this is pretty thick as a, I mean, a canopy is sort of suggested as a light covering. This one has essentially walls. Sure, and that was... Openings in it. Right, and that was something that did come up in other discussions. And so um, the original proposal had the canopy cantilevering over the outdoor dining. Right. And then once the design review was required for the extent of the canopy into the front yard setback, the applicant wanted to have the, um, the posts and the columns just to simplify the construction of it since the, the design review process was necessary. Thank you. Under, under this design, I mean, I... Can the applicant put up walls or anything in that area, or is it always going to remain open year-round based on what we're seeing here? It would need to remain um, as approved by the Planning Commission, uh, and any changes to what's approved by the Planning Commission would need to come back for review. So it's not like they could put up windows. I mean, it seems like it's going to be a very noisy patio, mm -hmm. but it's not like you could put up windows or do, and we've had, we had one here that was someone's trying to build a rock wall that was particularly had, um, but it's not like, this, this is as is, essentially it's an open air canopy, open right, air would, outdoor dining. That's the open what, air. That's what's there, okay. You could have a, a shade or something to go down and block sunlight, but not a permanent structure. Right, essentially open air though. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, if the applicant is here, will you please come forward? So you will have, um, please introduce yourselves when you sit, and then you'll have 10 minutes to add anything to what Sarah has already told us. Good afternoon, members of the Planning Commission. A.J. Pepper with Snell and Wilmer on behalf of the applicant. Great. Uh, Who do you have with you? I'm Joshua Patisha, the applicant. Okay. Uh, Gary Knapp uh, with JZW Architects. Great. Welcome. Go ahead, A.J. I uh, just wanted to make a couple of quick clarifications, um, and, and some of the questions that were asked just now actually get at these very issues. Uh, appreciate all of uh, staff's uh, work on this, and, and especially uh, Sarah's work on the report. Um, again, what we're talking about right now is, is in fact, just simply a canopy over the existing and approved uh, outdoor dining space. This is the uh, special exception application that was approved uh, about a year ago now, a little less, October 31st, 2018, which then permitted this outdoor dining space. Um, and so as you look at uh, the, over, the site plan, what the area that we're really talking about here is this kind of red outlined area. Um, and, and again, that, that space is permitted for outdoor dining use currently. And, and what we're really talking about, again, is constructing this canopy over top of it um, to provide some, um, some space. Um, for um, some covering for those patrons that are using that outdoor space. Now, bear in mind, again, this, this outdoor seating area is along the westerly face of, of the project, and so you can imagine in this, you know, summer sun or elsewise, um, you would have, you know, essentially sun kind of glaring down on you. And, and obviously the canopy, um, there have been some studies that we've done um, that have indicated the need for this canopy just for the sake of making it a more kind of comfortable environment from a, from a purely temperature perspective. 
Um, and, and, and also, obviously, um, one of the things that I think was hit on was this question about, you know, the posts and the, the ease, or excuse me, the, uh, the change in the construction method as well. The, the benefit of using this post method um, as opposed to just simply a, a cantilevered system as well is obviously we're, we're fronting right along there to 700. And so you can imagine that there's some um, traffic and so on. And, and this kind of provides a little bit of a barrier from that traffic, I think, almost psychologically for patrons sitting on the patio there. Um, would likely kind of provide a little bit of uh, defense from the street. Uh, and, and so I think it, it serves a, a, a definite uh, purpose, both from uh, psychological as well as safety. Again, that's kind of outside of the uh, scope of the review, but nonetheless uh, relevant, I think. And, and so again, this was covered very well in, in Exhibit H of the staff report, but just want to kind of touch on a couple of the key pieces. Now, obviously, the, the neighborhood commercial zone is, is um, you know, allows for this type of use. It's intended to encourage um, small local businesses. This is just that. Uh, we're talking about kind of a smaller one-off restaurant. Uh, we're not talking about a chain. This isn't, you know, this is very much intended to be a social gathering place. Uh, and specifically the patio, you have kind of this ability to kind of come together, socialize, uh, while still partake of kind of the outdoor space and, and the environment that, uh, that Utah has to offer. Um, again, this is oriented to the sidewalk and specifically to the pedestrians. As you'll see in the, in the layout and the overall design of the canopy, um, this is intended to really pull the pedestrians in from off the street. The overall layout with the sidewalks, the bike rack, and so on was designed with the pedestrian in mind as opposed to vehicular use. Uh, and you can see that, again, that kind of permeates the overall design of, of the site as well. Um, and, and lastly, again, this is consistent with the um, you know, plan for Salt Lake as well as the Central Community Master Plan. Um, and, and we think that this is, will be a great addition to the neighborhood and, and to, the, uh, to the overall environment and really give uh, residents in the area a new place to, uh, to come and gather, socialize, and eat. So happy to answer any other questions the Planning Commission may have. Thank you. Are there, are there any questions for the applicant at this point? And those posts are two by sixes. Is that what they're made of? Yeah. My reading yes. your design stuff right. The two by six wood posts. Mm -hmm. okay. And there's like multiple put together, or just like one? Just one. And um, let me just double check that. Um, Looks like just one from what I'm seeing. Yeah, there's but. just one, but I was, I think they're eight by eight. Sorry. I think, well, and, and to be honest, the structural engineer, we want to get this approval to get the exact size, but I think at this point they would be an eight by eight, eight, by eight post, wood post. At, at the most. Thanks. Other What's problems? the durability of them? The durability? Um, the wood posts are, are very durable. Um, the way that they make them, they would obviously need to be painted or, or however we do that. Um, so they would need some recurring maintenance on them, but they are, um, I mean, I think the, the life span of, of a, a wood post is like 60 years, something like that. Thank you. Okay. So, um, oh, I'm sorry. No, please go. So, uh, why did you choose a Gabion wall when on that that material is not used anywhere else in the project? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I've been uh, studying quite a bit of architecture for many years, and I'm a big fan of the uh, look of the architecture of a Gabion wall, and I think it uh, complements the whole feel for the project. So yeah, the owner, um, it was his idea to bring in the Gabion wall, which I thought was a good one. Um, it does bring kind of, uh, you know, we use those rocks in the Gabion wall, if you've seen it, and it um, just has a nice feel, outdoor feel, and, and kind of goes with what we have here in Utah. Seeing no other questions, we'll have you step back for the moment. And we will open the meeting up to a public hearing. First of all, is there anybody from the Neighborhood Community Council? Seeing none, um, I have a card for Mark Mason. Is that you? Come on forward. So Mark, if you'll give your name in the microphone and then you'll have two minutes. Uh, Mark Mason, I own the property just south. Uh, it's a duplex 
It's got a garage for each side. Unfortunately, the garages are unusable. Uh, the property has flooded three times in the last five years, all called 100-year storms. However, the grading of 7th East causes water to go over the sidewalks into the garages. So my property is very dependent on parking. When I look at the, the renderings, there's 90 seats inside this restaurant, 36 on the patio. 36 on the patio that adjoin my property, there's going to be a considerable amount of noise coming off of this. There's going to be limited parking available when my tenants come home at night because it's a dinner rush. If we look at comparable properties or restaurant communities, if you look at Park Cafe around the corner, parking is a challenge there, and that's a breakfast nook. So everybody that lives in the neighborhood has already parked by the time patrons are coming in the morning. What this will do with a dinner rush is actually have a negative effect on the tenants and their ability to park close to their property, as well as increased walk traffic, which, you know, the, there's been issues at 7th East in Liberty Park where I would not be as comfortable with asking my tenants to walk several blocks in the neighborhood at night in the dark because the lighting is not great either. There's been a shooting at Liberty Park about a year and a half ago, and that's not something I can encourage, and it's going to have a negative impact on my property. Okay, thank you very much. Is there anybody else that would like to make a public comment? Seeing none, we will close the public hearing and we will bring, um, well, do we have questions for the applicant or staff that we need to bring forward? Yes, I wanna ask okay. about the parking. Great, then let's uh, have both the applicant and staff come forward and we can ask that question. So I guess my real question is, has the parking, uh, number of parking spaces changed or the, even the parking arrangement changed since we approved this project before? What do you mean as far as approving the project before? I don't think we, I don't think we saw this before. We didn't see this one before. But, but they've already been granted access, or the, the, the extension of, the dining area has already, that's already gone through. That is not before us today. Correct. So, that was so, done administratively. Okay. So right. I think kind of to your point, we're yes. not, we are not, no decision, as Matt said earlier, that we're making today has any impact on the parking. That's already been considered administratively. Correct. And just of note as well, relative to the code and what's required for, for the zone there, the, the site is actually overparked, um, given the construction of bike racks and so on. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Um, and in the context of noise for this project, that's not before us either. They just have to bot follow by the normal... Salt Lake County Health Department noise guidelines. Correct. They're the criteria for a design review that are before you tonight. The, I can add the outdoor dining has some limitations on what types of activities can happen, like music and things like that, to also help uh, during certain hours to help reduce uh, noise impacts. And what are the planned uh, hours of operation? It's from 11.30 uh, a.m. till 10 p.m. And there'll be no music out on the patio. Is this seven days a week? Seven days a week. Yeah. Is this unusual for design review to address setback issues? For some reason that feels awkward to me and I don't know why. Um, not really, it's just something so, Earlier this, this year, we adopted new design review regulations. So it used to be that we could do um, modifications to setbacks through staff approvals. So that's usually how they, hap how they happened. But since the rules changed, those have to now come to the Planning Commission. Hmm. So it's just a new thing that you guys haven't seen. We have approved these, particularly in this same zone. Um, a lot of areas, there's buildings that are built up to the 
property line and somebody comes in to build a new building and they want to match that instead of having to be set back 15 feet. So. Any questions or discussion? Madam Chair, can I make a comment? So there was a comment about the two stalls. I think they're actually shown in that rendering that would be to the side of the outdoor, the structure, <laughs> I guess. Um, and so reading the regulation, the required, you're, you're approving a reduction in the required front yard. So that required front, if the planning commission were to approve this, that required front yard goes down to whatever feet that request is, three feet. Three feet. And so if those parking stalls are outside of that required front yard. That's not a violation. You can actually authorize those stalls. So that would help. I, I mean, it almost, I don't know how much more parking that adds, doubles it or something, but um, One. it's something that for the commission to, to think about as you're, as you're discussing. Because they that. can't put parking, they couldn't put parking in the place of this outdoor dining regardless. Well, it's, already, it's there now, mm -hmm. so it could be used if they weren't doing anything in that area. They, can, they have a right to maintain the existing parking as is. If they were to do this but, addition, build out the restaurant, and have well, a spot or two down that way, probably not. Yeah, once, it, once that parking goes away, any new parking would have to comply with the current regulation. So, yeah, they, they wouldn't be able to, to get that if they were to make a change and then try to go back. It's not like we could put parking along that front row. So was, we, we couldn't put parking where that outdoor dining is if we wanted to with no, the addition and changes no under the current not code. yeah that would that would have code. to go through a plan development process so um this is a question for nick as well i think um the plan the project site plan right now has um a lot of green space where there could be parking and i'm wondering if allowing more parking uh, if we had less setback area if we could if there could be more paving area for parking is that because we have a, a big thing on the corner I mean, and you're gonna get so, one you're gonna get one stall that's not gonna solve the problem well and <laughs> well so but no a redesign would make it would you might get three or four more stalls the, because it, right now you can barely park there at all yeah, the so way that, it's designed. That, the issue with that is that that would be, the, the corner side yard has the same setback as the front yard. Right. And so there would have to be a reduction in that required yard. Right. Um, I think generally when we, when we have this close integration of commercial uses with residential neighborhoods, um, especially on a street that Roosevelt is, mostly residential we prefer to i think from an urban design perspective keep that green space instead of having it be replaced with parking um, for those that may be familiar a very similar situation where all the landscaping was removed and it's all parking now is in the 15th and 15th neighborhood where the einstein's bagel shop is that's the beautiful. parking lot is basically up against the sidewalk and it, it creates a situ uh, an uncomfortable situation for pedestrians so okay thank you that's my only question. So um, I do have a comment since we are on a design review about the design. And um, so two comments. One, the, 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 the wall that's around the, I, I think that this ha conveys a sense more of a, you know, of a, a porch that's uh, almost filled in. And I would rather see the, um, the, knee wall sort of reduced in height. It's now a minimum of 42 with 45 inches in the front where the gabion wall is. And I'm assuming it's a little higher for some reason. And, um, um, and I would like to see it about all of it, about 40 inches. So it's, it's not here, it's here. You know, it's, it's lower so that you have more view into this space and it doesn't create that sense of a wall in the front, like you actually have a building there. Um, 
And I would also like to see the material be consistent all the way around on that wall. So if it's gabion, it's gabion. If it's wood, it's wood, but not sort of change material in the middle here. Okay, thank you. A normal fence in the front yard is a four foot fence or what's a normal front yard fence? I'm sorry, what was that? A normal fence in a front yard, four feet? Yeah, that's the maximum allowed by ordinance. My, my, my comment would be, um, I think to reduce some of the heaviness um, my colleague had mentioned, um, would be to reduce the thickness of the upper canopy to create a feeling of lightness versus having so much heaviness on top and on bottom. I think that just creates an unbalance in the feel, where if you were to lighten that up, I think that could help reduce that. I agree with that too. We're, we're, we're trying to get, I think, here is that this structure seems very, um, a little too solid, and it needs to have a little more lightness of feeling all the way around, I think. Would anybody like to make a motion? Are we there yet? How far is that fence from the property line or the sidewalk? No, that's not a fence. That gave you on a wall. Sorry. <laughs> there, oh, do you know the precise number? Uh, you can correct me if you have a more precise number, but there, so it would leave a three foot front yard, and then a, there's approximately about two feet between um, the property line and the sidewalk. Does that sound about right to you? So three yeah, foot sidewalk. front yard, two feet, Five feet. sidewalk, two feet park, two foot park strip. Well, you're saying to the sidewalk? Them. Yeah, to the sidewalk. There's actually about five feet to the sidewalk. It's from the... I'll find it on the design. Yeah, it's five feet. Well, it's five feet to the sidewalk, sidewalk, and then park strip. And does that bring the Gabion Wall flush then with the residential house to the, uh, to the south? That makes sense. Hmm. That's I guess really what I'm trying to get at is that like you have that, Pretty you know, close. 703 Emerson Avenue, and if we're extending this building all the way out, are we? Is that flush then with that the kind of yeah? Those that third 703 house like that because that that house probably has a four foot side yard, right? If you look on page. 40 of the staff report, you can see a side, um, you can see the side of that duplex to the south, and um, it looks like it may be set back a little further than that from the sidewalk. 40 by the PDF, by the bottom of the page numbers. I'm just struggling with the, with the new thing. Well, on, on page six, you see the aerial photograph, and that's a pretty good indication. You're talking about the picture there. Okay, all right, because of the hill's there, so it's a little bit more than four feet, okay. So I would also say that I, I like the idea of an outdoor dining space here. I'm not opposed to having a um, the um, extension out towards the street. The setback is, I think, reasonable given both the property to the north and to the south of this um, of this building, as shown on the aerial photograph here. Although I would like to actually know what those dimensions are, sometime in a staff report. Um, so, um, yeah, I would, I'm, I would like to make a motion. Everybody wants. Yes. And I am going on number two here of the motions. 
motion to approve conditions modified by the Planning Commission. Based on the findings listed in the staff report, the information presented and input received during the public hearing, I move that the Planning Commission approve the design review petition PLNPCM 2019-00620 for reduction of approximately 12 feet of the 15-foot front yard subject to the conditions of approval listed in the staff report with the following modifications. Number one, the material of the uh, canopied area should be made uh, less um, solid so that it appears lighter, uh, including making the lower wall the same material all the way around and lowering the height of that wall to no more than 42 inches. Thank you, Brenda. Final, final approval of the details noted in the conditions shall be delegated to the planning staff and also the other conditions listed in the staff report. Thank you. Did I do that right? What about the parking? Uh, the parking is I would addressed that we approve in number parking. four. I know, but I would propose that we approve the parking as proposed in the application as opposed to deny the additional parking in the front yard. That would be a friendly amendment. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have a second on that? A second. Okay. Madam Chair, can I ask for a little bit of clarification on <laughs> What less solid? I'm assuming that means reduce the thickness. Yes, reduce okay. the, the <laughs> reduce the the height of the upper canopy and reduce the height of the lower wall around the area. All right. Thank you. Forty two inches, though you said, right? Right. No more than forty two inches. And sorry, one other question too. Reducing the height of the canopy. You're talking the. Along the top there, this section, yeah, kind of make it shrinking, thinning that out yeah. a little the bit. Thickness, the height, though, the thickness, but the, the height thickness obviously of the structural will be support for the perfect. canopy. No, not the structural support, just the canopy. Just the, the canopy. Thickness the thickness of the canopy. The top being of the canopy. Yeah. Okay. But we're not worried about the height of the canopy. The no, height. not height of okay. the canopy. Yeah. yeah. All right. Just the thickness of it. Right. That clear as mud. Actually, that's pretty clear. For okay. Us. Good. We're good. <laughs> um, is the applicant have any comments on those conditions? Um, a little bit more clarification in the uh, thickness of the height. Are you talking about vertical? Yes. Going? Okay, I understand. Okay, so that's a motion by Brenda and a second by John. So are we ready to vote? All right, Adrian. Yes. Brenda? Yes. Weston? Uh, yes. Carolyn? Agree. John? Yes. Amy? Yes. And Matt? Yes. Unanimous. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. I'm excited to see something go in there. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Um, looks like Casey for the Kerrigan Canyon lot five. We're looking at a setback modification in Kerrigan Canyon Drive. And a reminder, if anybody wants to speak, I did get one card. If anybody else would like to speak, please fill this out and give it to one of the ends, and we'll, it'll just keep things moving along. All right, Casey, thank you. <clears throat> 
Okay, thanks for your patience there. This item is a um, modification to an older plan development. In 1982, the Kerrigan Cove subdivision slash plan development was approved up in Kerrigan Canyon. As you can see here on the aerial photograph, and just for a general sense, that's a, essentially at the very top of 2100 South, kind of that direction. And um, there is a lot in this 20 lot development that uh, has yet to be built on. And that's the lot highlighted in yellow and the subject of our uh, application, uh, of the application tonight. And the request is, uh, pertains to the side yard setback. Um, if you reviewed the applicant's request, it also included a request related to the front yard. And uh, staff looked at that, reviewed that, and compared that to the plat of this particular subdivision. And the plat had some specific notes regarding the front setback. It essentially stated that the front property line is the, also the front setback line. And, and after that determination was made, um, the applicant's request for a reduction in front yard setback became I irrelevant. So I just want to point that out. Uh, the applicant claimed that the lot was unbuildable because of what they thought the front setback was, but because that is now the front lot line as far as where the building can be built to, um, it, it's not necessarily unbuildable. For those that went up to visit the site today, um, you can kind of see from this panoramic that I tried to piece together uh, a general sense of the property and the trees that are on there. And um, because of the trees, it's hard to see where the slope starts, but it does go up in the photograph um, approximately anywhere between 30 and 50 feet from the front property line. This might give you a little better sense. Uh, these images are in your staff report. On the left is just a rendering of what the structure is proposed to look like. At the left of that image is the garage, and that is the side yard that is in question. The required side yard for the, uh, based on the zoning, would be 20 feet. The applicant is requesting 10 feet. And in their site plan to the right, in that area highlighted by that red line, that is the 10-foot setback in question. Uh, on that same diagram, you can see the, there's a, a yellow, uh, excuse me, a blue, oh, can't see that. A, a blue line just behind the house that indicates the uh, undevelopable limit line or the developable limit line beyond that per the plat uh, no structures are to be located this next slide um, contains three images just to give you a sense of, of the subdivision when it was approved the um, lot is in red highlighted or drawn in red the highlighted sections in yellow are the language on the plat that reference the, um, the building setback. It indicates that the front lot line is the, also the, the setback line. For, uh, and that only pertains to a certain number of lots. It's uh, one, one and two, which you can see in the lower left corner, lots three, four, five, and part of six, and then 17, 18, 19, and 20. Those to the right of the development have a different setback. And that's, again, front setback. As far as um, the side yard setbacks, the plat is silent on that. It doesn't specify a side yard setback. And that, over the years, the city has defaulted to the zoning district, which says 20 feet. Um, the, the development, uh, Conditions, covenants, and restrictions has a different setback uh, for buildings. Um, and as I looked at the aerial photograph of this development, uh, I noticed at least half of the homes uh, 
appeared to be closer than 20 feet, some significantly closer than 20 feet to the side lot line. And I couldn't find uh, permits or any specific variances or other city action um, clearly stating what went on with those particular projects. Uh, but there are a number that are closer than 20 feet. So, um, in your packet, there was also a slope map that was done at the original development. And you can see that a, a number of those lots, um, well, all lots have undevelopable areas on them, which are areas greater than 40% in slope. This particular lot five had the least buildable area left after those slopes. Um, so given the, the limited area available for building, um, the, the history of buildings in that subdivision that are closer than 20 feet um, and the, the, the overall nature of the topography, which is, is fairly steep, treed, um, staff feels that granting this reduction in, uh, of 10 feet would still be in conformity with the overall plan development um, and certainly is a setback greater than some of the existing houses um, in the development. So staff recommends that the modification be approved and um, I'll leave it at that. So Casey, I have a question in regards to the relationship to ordinances and HOAs, because HOAs can have their own set of rules, correct? Correct. So when the city or the planning commission gives approval for a modification of any kind, um, how does that work with the HOA? partners you know. we're not too concerned about that because we're not party to those private covenants um, so as long as whatever you grant is is according to the the standard set and and the process is allowed uh, the HOA is on their own to figure out how to deal with the their particular restrictions okay so are you done um, so in the in the packet, there's a letter where the HOA outlines where this development does not meet their their standards. Um, that would then be up to the developer and the HOA through their own private legal action to resolve. And, and those standards that they're discussing here are not before us as a body. That's correct. I'm... Another question, not related, is it that, that rear lot line, that rear, the blue line, the developer line, is that set by the city or is that set by the plat? Like, how, why is that blue line drawn? Right. How, that, where it's drawn? That's on the plat, uh, but it was in agreement between the city and the developer. So the original developer put that line there? Yes. And is there any reason it could or could not be moved? Um, the plat steep could be slopes? amended. Aren't those, isn't that like a really steep slope? It is, that, that line marks where the 40% slope begins. Back when the project was approved, 40% slope was the determined unbuildable area. Uh, now it's at 30%. Um, so even less steep. Less, yes. So uh, they could theoretically try to amend the plat and, and maybe get more specific, more detailed as to where that line might go, but in general, probably not gonna change that much. Any other questions for Casey at this time? All right, if the applicant is here, will you please come forward? Go ahead and when you're seated, state your name and you'll have 10 minutes to add to anything Casey has already told us. Sure, um, I'll be faster. Great. Uh, my name is Lindsay Nicola and I own um, the lot in Kerrigan Canyon. Uh, when I first saw Lot 5, I immediately fell in love with it. Um, the trees, the hillside, and the privacy up there uh, was something that drew me to the lot, and I was very excited that with some hard work because of the uniqueness of the lot that I could potentially you know, live somewhere that um, is both beautiful and remote, but also just so close to downtown Salt Lake City. So I really love this lot. 
Um, so, oh, sorry. <laughs> From, um, so after a few rounds of feedback uh, in this process and paying particular attention to the shape of the lot and how unique it is, uh, we feel like we've come up with a plan that um, really respects the landscape, that doesn't require um, an exorbitant amount of removal of the scrub oak up there, that still maintains a level of privacy with the neighbors to the east and the west, and that ultimately you know, lives in harmony with the topography of the land and with the shape of the lot, because it's a bit of an odd shape. Um, throughout this process, my goal has been to be totally transparent, to be courteous, but also to really respect the fact that this modification process only exists so that people will ask for the smallest amount of a modification that they need. Um, up until this point in the process, we have had many meetings and lots of communication both with city staff and also um, with the HOA of the subdivision. And we feel like the plan that we have come up with does ask for the minimum that we could ask for. And we're really excited about that. Like, we feel great about this project. Um, you know, as Casey mentioned in his report, um, you know, from overhead shots and from the research that we could do, you know, around but approximately seven to nine of the homes in the lot currently do not um, meet the 20 foot side yard requirement. And so we also feel like our plan lives in harmony with that um, and that it would fit right into the development. So thank you for your time and consideration on this. Great, if you'll wait right there, we may have questions. Does anybody have a question for the applicant? Okay, not at this point, we may call you back up. Thank you. Okay, at this point, we will open the public hearing. Um, first, is there anybody from the community council that is here? Seeing none, first I have uh, Kelly Ragsdale. If you are here, if you can come forward. So thank you for being here. If you will state your name, and then you'll have two minutes. I'm Kelly Ragsdale. I'm the, one of the immediate neighbors adjacent to this property. Um, I've sent in my, my complaints and concerns about this. I hope you've had a chance to read them. There's a few pictures in there. Um, if you have read them, I won't reiterate too much other than um, as, as far as the um, variances that are asking or they're requesting, I am against them because they do change the characteristics of the canyon. They change the setting immediately around my home and my neighbor's home. Um, and nobody up there is saying that that property is unbuildable, that it's just, um, it need, that the plans can, or something can be put on that property as is, and they don't really necessarily need a variance or expand over it on other people's property. Um, the, just in listening to things today and then listening or getting information in the last couple of weeks, the only thing I'd like to add is, is that this has kind of been interesting in that the petitioner has provided the, the HOA and the neighbors with a bunch of information. Um, I was one of the ones that got a hold of Casey Stewart to ask more questions about the process here and how this all went. Casey's been providing us all with a bunch of additional information that the city's come up with studies, things that you've seen come up here, um, recommendations from the city on, on what's been done in the canyon, what hasn't been done. And it's quite surprising to me because we've never seen any of this up until just a week or two ago. We haven't had a chance to study it. Like I said, it does change the characteristics in the canyon quite a bit. It's new information to a lot of us and as we all study it, more information's coming about, out about things that have been done historically up there and that are on record. There is an active HOA that monitors this kind of stuff, is in place to look at this. And I feel that myself privately as an individual and then the HOA has been left out of the process to some degree. I'm not asking that the city not allow anything at all. What I'm asking for ultimately is that we have a chance to study this further before you make any decisions. I think there needs to be more engineering done. I think an intelligent set of architectural plans needs to be done. And if any of you were up there today, I heard you had a site visit. That's your time. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, Colin King. 
Same with you. Wait till you, you're seated so we can get your name, and then you'll have two minutes. Two minutes? Two minutes, and you'll hear the bell. My name is Colin King. I'm the president of the HOA at Kerrigan Canyon. There are seven different homeowners here tonight. All of us object to this variance request. I object to it. We object to it on behalf of the HOA board, and we've sent letters to the petitioners, the requesters. Uh, those are part of the record. I also sent a letter yesterday to Casey Stewart, and that's part of your packet. The reason, one thing I want to make clear right now, and, and that is the staff recommendation to allow this variance is based on what I see inadequate and, in fact, factually wrong information. They said, <clears throat> we looked at an overhead satellite picture. I've had that picture for years. And, and based on just an estimate of, from an overhead satellite picture, they say, well, it looks like seven to ten other lots or homes also violate or have variances less than the 20-foot Salt Lake zoning side setback. That's flatly wrong. I went out there today and measured every single difference in side setbacks with my measuring tape in the middle of that rainstorm. It took me an hour. There is one home that is less than the 20-foot side setback. One home and one home only. And it's only on one side of that home. So it is not in conformity, in substantial conformity, to grant this variance. These homes in this uh, development have relied on, even though our HOA had a smaller setback, we've relied on for 30 years the Salt Lake zoning ordinance allowing only 20 feet. And there was only one variation from that. I'm asking you to reject this application because it's contrary to the, uh, con to the substantial uh, to all the other homes except one exception. And it is an impairment in many ways to the privacy of the view lines and the, and the nature of the homes and the distinctive value of these homes having their privacy and their separation. Thank you. Please consider this uh, our request. Thank you very much. Okay, those are the only two cards I have. Is there anybody else? This is your last chance to say something. All right, seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. And I think we're gonna have questions for staff and the applicants. So let's have you both come up and we'll see where the commission is. This is my planner. Say, to, say it into the microphone so we can hear this you. This is um, the planner on the project and the architect on the project, and so they'll have information. Okay, and can we get your names? Kristen Clifford. Kristen. And Krista Dimmick. Thank you very much for being here. Okay. So, Casey, it seems that um, a lot of this will hinge on that information about my, my understanding is that when this was originally platted, that's, that's the standard in which we have to adhere to, um, or you would normally adhere to. So if it was originally platted with allowing, that it was, it was laid out that it was allowing 10 foot setbacks, then that's what the standard would be. Is that right? If that's how it were originally platted. Correct. And, and the staff report, it says there was no indication of what the setback was on the side yards at, at, at all. And, and so you're going based purely on your observation from these satellite images that, that there seems to be a pattern that that 20 um, foot setback is has not been um, clearly adhered to over over the history of this project. Um, and then we have the argue, argument from the property uh, or the um, HOA president um, arguing that that's not the case. Is there a way to more definitively uh, have that information. Um, it seems like that's pretty critical to the decision here. Um, and so I, I, I mean, I, I don't know, your satellite imagery using GIS, I, I assume it's probably relatively accurate. I, I don't know if you can maybe just speak to that. Uh, that's a fair question. I mean, it's, it's, it's accuracy is, is uh, I don't know, I, I can't attest to it. Um, whether I took a tape measure out there and, and measured it, I, I, you know, I would think that might be accurate, but really without a surveyor who's, who's licensed in the state to declare what a dimension is, um, that's probably the only way to really define what the dimension is. So without a pretty immense cost, it's gonna, we're not going to get to that 
really specific information. Right. Yeah. Okay. The, the challenge would be, unless the property lines are clearly marked. Right. I mean, we, obviously you know where the homes are, but you don't visually know where property lines are unless somehow they're clearly marked and that mark is accurate. Right. So, yeah, survey would be the only way to really determine that. Okay. Thank you. I'm still trying to figure out how this, um, the HOA stuff does or does not. In particular, I'm looking at this, the table that you include in your staff report where you have the design item, the zoning restrictions, the HOA restriction, and the proposed. And that's the applicant's information. That's the applicant's information. And if we confirm, okay. So I mean like in the HOA restriction where it says eight feet combined, is that in their written rules or is that, that is in their written rules? So the CCNRs are different from what the city requires. The I city understand. is more strict than what the CCNRs require. And let me just clarify, it's eight feet, eight feet minimum on one side with a total combined of 20 for yeah, both I sides that. setbacks. So that, that, so, so that, but that is listed in the HOA in their written, and then it's whether or not, and we've got ours, but presumably when you're doing a plan development, you're moving things around all the time. And so uh, ours, you know, the question before is whether or not this proposal is consistent with the other development, correct? The standard we're trying to consider. Right, the, there's one standard under the modification section for plan developments, and it's highlighted in, in bold in your report, but essentially that it's, even with the modification, it's still in conformity with the original development. When was the last time another house was built in this development? Do you have any sense of that? I, I couldn't pin down, but I, it seems like early 2000s might have been the, the last permit I could find. And would have that, did, and do we know if that person followed a 20 foot side yard setback on both sides I, or, they, or did they follow the HOA? I couldn't find any plans, um, so I, I couldn't tell you. So it's unclear if we've like been enforcing this 20 foot setback or not. Okay. Right. Do we know is the proposed footprint of this building significantly different than the existing houses? You want to know if our house is very different from the other homes? The footprint. The footprint of the home? Um, Meaning the, the, you know, how much, I don't care so much about square footage, just the, the out, footprint yeah. on the land. If I could, I can't speak to exact footprint. They'll pull up an aerial. I can speak to building square footages, um, so building area overall. The average um, square footage is 7,688 square feet throughout the subdivision. The largest area of a home there is 14,339. The smallest existing is 3,878. We are proposing 3,215, so it will absolutely be the smallest throughout the subdivision. And that is not including garage space, that's just exterior wall to exterior wall of livable space. Thank you. Casey, is this, is this what you used for your analysis, this image here? No, this image is part of the applicant's uh, information. Not, not in the staff report, this is what they brought to present tonight. Okay, I mean, there's one similar in the staff report, and is, I mean, how, I, I don't, I guess I, I just, I'm no expert on this sort of document, is how accurate is something like this usually? I'll let like with property, it's got property lines on it and it's got footprints of buildings. Um, yes, so I can speak to that. Okay. Um, the, the property lines are based on the uh, plat map. Okay. Um, and then the uh, building footprints are superimposed by a satellite image. Um, so there is some level of inaccuracy there. Um, However, uh, with scale, you know, they're, they're approximately scaled to be reflectant of that. And then um, as you see, lot five, our proposal is um, to scale on, on this image as well. 
Um, and then I also wanted to add that the total footprint, so um, Kristen mentioned the total square footage, but this footprint is um, 2,700 square feet. Madam Chairman? Yes. I would like to <clears throat> move motion to approve consistent with staff recommendation based on the information in the staff report, the information presented, and the input received during the public hearing. I move that the Planning Commission approve a major modifications to the Kerrigan Cove Plan Development Subdivision, aka BOA case number 8862 of 1982 to allow a building setback of 10 feet along the east side yard within the platable building area. Thank you, Brenda. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Adrian. All right. Matt, we're going to start with you. Um, yes. Thank you, Amy. Yeah, considering that the HOA's rules are even less in terms of a setback, I'm inclined to approve it, so I agree. Thank you. John? Uh, yes. Carolyn? Agree. Weston? Um, I'm just going to say, I, you know, it feels like there's a lot of, uh, um, I'll use the word hesitance from the HOA to um, reading the staff report to any new project here. Um, and what I didn't hear from the community was a specific reason as to why we could not, we, why, why, why we should not approve a reduced setback on the side yard. Um, and so I'll vote yes as well. Great. Brenda? Yes. And Adrian? Yes. Thank you. It's unanimous. You've got your permit from us. Thank you. So now we move into a work session portion of our meeting. Um, Eric is here. He's going to come talk to us about parking. Grab some water. I'll leave a few project cards out here if anyone in the audience wants them. I'm going to pass out some paper copies. I just made them lunch. As a reference, we're going to go through a number of things, and it might just be easier for you to do this. They're all in the Dropbox, but it might be easier for you to be able to turn to that as a reference. So, members of the commission, nice to be with you here tonight. And uh, this is kind of two years in the making to get to this point on the... Uh, rewrite of the off-street parking chapter of the zoning ordinance. And so tonight um, we will be going through it. Um, we'll give a, a brief overview and kind of framework and background for members of the audience, for newer members of the commission, and to just give us all a refresher of where we are with this. Um, again, this is a, a rewrite of the uh, parking chapter of the zoning ordinance. And as we look at the original project scope, this is essentially what we were tasked with accomplishing by uh, rewriting the zoning ordinance. And so first and foremost was to reconsider the current minimum and maximum parking uh, allowed and required on properties to see where we were doing well, where we needed to uh, lower the minimums, and where we needed to increase the maximums. Um, additionally, we wanted to re-review the uh, permitted alternatives, and this is the ability to either raise or lower those parking requirements and see if those uh, standards that we had in place were still uh, accomplishing what we originally intended or if there was something else we should be doing. The third was to consider basic parking lot design, uh, access points, 
uh, and the dimensional standards. So that's what was envisioned with the rewrite of here, uh, of this chapter. So, um, not sure what that is. As we, um, so we did this, there was a handful of purposes that were identified with the rewrite. And with any code revision, first and foremost, we want to align it with the goals of Plan Salt Lake. We want to align it with uh, the goals and objectives already established citywide and also with the neighborhood master plans. And so those were documents that we combed through to uh, try to establish, well, what were the objectives written in there? And, uh, and then next was um, to focus on infill development and redevelopment and to be able to encourage that and facilitate it uh, more easily and more appropriately. And the next was, of course, to simplify the, the code, which um, currently there's a lot of things related to parking dispersed in many chapters, and there's a lot of complexity to it, both for staff, for developers, and it's just um, it needed some simplicity to it. And then, of course, we, we wanted to modernize it um, based on planning best practices and market trends and, and uh, be able to implement those things a little better. And lastly, um, we wanted to consider, reconsider this idea of a one-size-fits-all approach, which basically is the premise that, for example, a restaurant uh, downtown versus on Redwood Road versus 9th and 9th versus near an industrial area would somehow require the same parking, which our ordinance currently uh, assumes. So with that, we made a lot of revisions and um, a lot of it is general, just going through the whole thing, kind of combing through it. And we kind of had four guiding principles throughout those. Um, and they're shown in green here. First, we wanted to emphasize pedestrian scale development. Um, we wanted to recognize, you know, we're the capital city, we're uh, a largely built out environment. We want to focus on the individual and, and be able to um, create standards based on that. So just one example on that, for example, we looked at the bike standards. Um, currently, our bicycle parking standards are such that they're a percentage of supplied parking. Well, so if people get, got a reduction in parking, they also gave us a reduction in bike parking, which is, of course, backwards. If you supply less parking, you want more bike parking. Bike parking. And uh, so we, you know, for example, that's one thing we did for pedestrian scale development is looked at that. As far as for economic growth, um, uh, we reconsidered, for example, uh, the regulations on affordable housing and for senior housing to find relaxed standards for parking there. As we know, that's a substantial cost and uh, generally is not uh, needed on the same level as, as uh, other more traditional housing. Um, and then as far as uh, ordinance usability, um, one of the things we did was uh, uh, simplified the process for adjustments. So currently, uh, different things had to go through, like a special exception, or they um, needed more complicated interpretations for something as simple as changing the angle of certain parking or just minor, um, minor details. Sorry, I'm having a little trouble with this laptop. Uh, and then with, oh, is that, okay. No, no look, there we go, sorry. It's not wanting to go. Okay, there we go. And then also um, talking about environmental best practices, um, we just wanted to um, consider, you know, reconsider options such as uh, car share, the ability for people to um, have a, a vehicle that they could 
uh, have a subscription to and, and use only as needed and be able to lower parking counts. But of course, with this, uh, you know, there was feedback from the Planning Commission, from uh, developers, from business owners, from residents, community council, and then of course going through the, the, the different plans and um, kind of making decisions based on those instruments. So um, with that, one of the, of course, the one of the biggest changes was this idea of coming up with parking contexts and just a refresher on those. This is the kind of the one size fits all approach. And so we, we were able to come up with four different contexts. Um, the transit context is of course located along transit lines. It's your highest density development and typically has the lowest parking demands. The urban center context is kind of that adjacent to downtown area or other you know areas such as Sugar House that have um, high density development, pretty good access to um, public transit or other mobility options and low to moderate parking demand. And then a neighborhood center, these typically uh, kind of the poster child for that is kind of the ninth and ninth area. Those are typically um, areas that have neighborhood scale development, um, lots of pedestrian amenities, but maybe are not well serviced by transit. And they, we found that they really have the most varied parking needs. They have need to support the businesses with lots of parking or traffic, but we don't want that pouring into the neighborhoods. They're typically the most complicated scenario. The general context um, are areas that are not well serviced by mass transit, don't have a great mix of uh, uses. They uh, typically have the highest parking demand and they range from everything from single family areas to industrial uh, type uh, use uh, land uses. So um, with this, it should also be noted, we did explore the option. Uh, I'm going to show you a map here in a second and you're not going to be able to see everything perfectly well, but you can either look on your one supplied on the paper or you may uh, go to the drop box and zoom in on it and explore that a little bit more. Um, these contexts are based on zoning uh, designation. We did explore just going with a straight map based uh, context area. And as we explored that, found that it presented a number of challenges uh, with, you know, ideas of treating properties different that were zoned differently. It was much more difficult to administer, um, to modify and things like that. We felt that um, after kind of exploring it in its entirety that um, sticking to the context based on zoning designation was going to be the best option possible. So with that, it basically, this is how it came out. Um, the red shown there are the areas for transit context. And, um, and then the green is the urban center the blue neighborhood center and uh, everything else in gray would be the general context. Sure. Yes. Um, so when you're saying you tied it to the, the context to the district, so you went through then and figured out which zoning districts fit within each context? Yes. And I can tell you those and they're going to be also on your context sheets, which is going to be your next one. So it'll show the zoning designation on each one there and we'll talk more specifically about those. Um, but that was uh, so the other option would have been to delete parking from all zoning districts and do a parking overlay based on context. Es essentially, yes, have a map that said, okay, if you're in this area, you, you basically reference a map that you know draws those in, and it got very challenging when you thought about the idea of. So what if somebody does a, a, a parcel combination or something or other, redivides a subdivision, and now they're in two different zone, uh, you know, parking classifications or they acquire more property. It just, it got really messy to try to consider how that would be administered. And then, you know, there's a, a lot that are very small zoning designations that kind of wrap around each other on some of these fringe areas. And that, that really um, would have made it kind of unfair in a lot, in our opinion, in a lot of ways. So. Eric, I yeah. haven't seen how did you treat 
trail access areas and parks is those are destinations, but they don't seem to fit in your contexts. Um, so yeah, so they'd be in the open space. They would just be a, a general context. We don't, um, these were the contexts uh, that were based on uh, what we felt were zones that were proximate to mass transit and things like that. And so um, we can look, but yeah, parks and things like that are typically open space. And um, they right, would be- but they also the, have off-street parking challenges. And so, especially like some of the trailheads up in the foothills. Okay. And so you're not addressing those areas in this at all? Developments for, uh, for open space and parks generally come through the planning commission. They come through uh, those type of processes, and so that's where the, a lot of those things are looked at rather than being decided exclusively um, through a plan like this. And then also with the general context, what you'll see is we made the, the least modifications, so they have the highest parking demand. Um, the highest minimums and things like that. So hopefully that would help address that to pick up a recognition that, yeah, people, we don't have great options for people to get to a lot of those areas other than driving. Okay. Jump in here. Sure. So in response to your question, it's considered part of the general context, so what, which is essentially the, the gray area on the map, and that does have parking requirements. So if you're if you have an open space property, a park, and, and you want to propose a, a trailhead, you would go through the land use table and, and find trailhead. And uh, in this ordinance, we, we put the uses in a table, and a trailhead would require so many parking spaces, for instance. So, so we, we do address parking for open space areas. And we'll, we'll definitely be able to look at that more specifically in a minute here as far as those parking count numbers. Other questions to this point? Otherwise I can keep rolling through. Okay, um, sure. I don't know if this is the appropriate time, sorry. Okay. I, but I'll ask real fast, and just because it's with the map here. So the area south of, I guess, I, I, I think it's the ninth, ninth or the um, West Temple on-ramp there. Um, uh, why is all of that that's still on the transit, that's still on uh, the tracks line, would that not be considered a transit in the transit context and it's so, the general? So it is by zoning designation. So I assume not it's a necessarily zone that's proximity. Not. And we'll, we'll talk about what we've, uh, uh, what we're proposing for proximity to transit okay. in a di uh, despite the zoning designation. So we'll get to that in just a minute, and maybe let's see if that answers your question. It was an ill-timed question. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, so this is straight by zoning designation here. Eric, real quick, just to go okay. back to the open space question a little bit. Okay. Is, um, so this is something that's been an ongoing issue in the city. The, the draft ordinance actually has no minimum parking requirement for parks and open space. Um, and the reason for that is because we oftentimes, like in a small neighborhood park, we wouldn't want to build parking because it takes up the park space, it takes up the open space. Um, small trailheads up in the foothills, we don't want to take up um, private land to build parking lots. Uh, we want to just rely on on, on the street. Um, and so that's that's been a long-standing kind of viewpoint that the cities has that doesn't mean that we couldn't build it it just means that we're, we wouldn't be required to build it when we have when we have a facility that like a park or a trailhead or something like that so okay so uh, I wanted to give an update on the public process and so this is you had a briefing um, a little less than a year ago uh, where Clarion the consultant that originally worked on this project uh, gave, but um, so these are some of the things we've done since that time. Um, I don't need to run through everything here, but you can kind of look. We've we've held open houses um, numerous at different times of the day in different areas of the city. Um, tried to cover kind of the four corners. Uh, met with Downtown Alliance numerous times, working with them closely. Uh, Sugar House Community Council, the, their transportation subcommittee. Uh, we had a robust online engagement. Um, 
uh, page and uh, emails that went out, about 2,800 emails, uh, working with different developers and things like that, specifically sending out the draft ordinance, sending out summaries, looking for feedback and working with them. And feel that um, we were able to get to pretty consistent messages from those groups. And I'll kind of highlight those. Uh, citywide, respondents were generally pretty pleased with the proposed changes. Uh, people were, were, were very, uh, res um, they were pleased with the work we had done and basically um, wanted to see this move forward and thought it was uh, very needed. The biggest area of concern, you know, here's this whole ordinance, 48 pages or whatever it is, and there's all these ins and outs. And the primary concern of basically everyone was, well, what are the minimums and maximums? That's what they're most interested in. Okay. Um, a few other takeaways, though, specifically from like Sugar House in the east side. They felt that a lot of the alternatives that are currently on the books were far too permissive, that uh, developments that had gone in recently were able to make reductions that did not actually reduce parking demand, and that parking just ended up in the neighborhoods. And so that was something that they're very aware of and wanted to see uh, changed from the current ordinance. And overall, they were pleased with what we've proposed in the uh, in the ordinance before you. Um, additionally, they talked about, they, they felt that private development needed to bear the majority burden. Uh, they wanted to see them build parking garages would be preferred, and if they found ways to share those among businesses and things like that, they felt that that would be a really great solution. But do they want to live next to parking garages? Well, there are standards in place for parking garages and that to be behind businesses and things like that. Uh, and, and but be, then that would be next to the backyard right. of the people across the, I mean. Understood. Right. I know, we want it yeah. all. And, um, and they felt, Duh. for example, for this, the sentiment that uh, was shared was, um, you know, they, they were weary of too much parking pouring into single family residential neighborhoods on street. So that was uh, one of their sentiments. Also, they felt that uh, basically retail and restaurant um, uses needed low minimums to reuse a lot of the building stock that's there, but they needed to have high enough maximums to support their customer bases. And so that's kind of that complex scenario that we've talked about. And even in studying uh, what we did compared to other cities, we found that our maximums were way, way low compared to comparable cities. So that's something that we definitely uh, took note of. Um, the sentiment from the west side was largely, they were pleased with the regulations in place. They didn't want a lot of change. They felt that there wasn't enough transportation options available to them and there wasn't enough mix of uses to support too many changes, and they kind of asked, hey, hold off on too many changes in our area. We don't want to create problems where there aren't any. For downtown, one of the um, opinions that was expressed the most was that although in general for downtown parking demand is decreasing as transportation and other mobility options are made available, office space is actually nationwide is increasing for parking require, uh, needs. And basically what's happening is uh, more workers are fitting into smaller spaces as we get away from big filing cabinets and large spaces. They're able to come with their laptops and they're putting more employees in a smaller space. And with that, they need more parking. And um, this was also kind of based on their take rates of uh, public transit passes and things like that. And they also felt it was important to be compatible, uh, to be competitive with, um, you know, some of the development, office development happening in the south end of the valley. Um, with that, one of the things you'll see as we look at the ordinance, um, we're proposing that um, the maximum parking 
would not apply to structured parking. And we'll talk more about that. But they are in favor of that and felt that that was a good solution for offices in general that, um, you know, at least it wouldn't be spread out uh, surface parking throughout the downtown. And then uh, lastly, they talked about in general that the minimums and maximums needed to be flexible to kind of represent market realities. And uh, of course, you know, they're very cognitive of uh, what's happening in the business world and they want to be competitive. And so they, they really felt that a market-based approach is, is the best. Um, and, you know, of course, they, they recognize that, uh, you know, a, a dense downtown is also, and a, you know, a pedestrian-friendly downtown is in their best interest as well. So um, next, I wanted to talk about the alternatives to parking calculations. And the reason I'm going to this next is uh, we want to talk about the parking numbers tonight. But I want to have everyone have a good understanding that the number written on there has ways that it can be altered up or down. So I want to kind of set the table with that, make sure everyone's clear as to uh, what those alternatives are before we look at the exact numbers. Um, easiest way to do this was to just look at what we currently allow. So currently, we don't have an overall limit to the reductions that can be made. We have a provision for shared parking, and it's based on peak hours of use. And then we have one for uh, proximity to mass transit, and it allows up to a 50% reduction. We have one for valet parking, on-street parking credit, uh, meaning you could, you know, if there's stalls available in front of your business, you could count those towards your parking. And then we have a, a provision called transportation demand management, which deals with bike parking, uh, bike or car share, carpooling, unbundled parking, things like that. And that allows up to a 75% reduction in your required parking. Use of excess parking and park and ride lots, and then offsite parking um, as a tool to reduce parking requirements. Again, not just allowing for it, but to, if there's, if you could find off-site parking, you could actually reduce your required parking. And then we have pedestrian-friendly amenities, um, and they kind of have their own standard. What we found as we went through this is that a lot of these, though they were well-intentioned, didn't exactly equate to someone being less inclined to drive a car. For example, I like to highlight, we have one that talks about having a drinking fountain within 50 feet of an entrance. And although that's a great thing, and the people of Salt Lake are less thirsty because of it, it doesn't mean they're gonna get out of a car and uh, suddenly not drive to work. So um, we re-examined those, and, um, and again, with the, all the plans, with the feedback of the community and everything, um, what we're proposing and the reduced and revised parking calculations altogether is that we're saying that the total reductions allowed would be up to 40% uh, of the requirements. We have a provision for shared parking for two or more uses and now we base that on use rather than hours of operation and there's a table in there with calculations of, of how that works. And then we have one for proximity to transit, uh, like we did before, but this one allows up to 25% reduction, and that's when located within a quarter mile of fixed rail transit station platforms, uh, excluding single family or duplex uses. Um, I'll touch on that one pretty specifically. What we heard, um, well, first of all, we felt that the vast majority of our transit is covered by the transit context. Those that weren't, many of them were covered by the urban center context and felt that the few leftover properties would be covered with this. Um, with this, um, there was quite a bit of discussion as to which properties would be able to receive this, whether it was from the platform itself, whether it was from the line, whether it included high frequency bus routes, things like that. I think that's an important topic for this commission to discuss. 
the feedback we received primarily, there was, um, this was a fairly hot topic. We heard considerable voice that people did not want it from uh, bus routes or just the line itself, that they did not feel that that was fully reliable or something when a development goes in is going to be there for the next hundred years. Those routes can change and things like that. And they liked the permanency of a fixed rail transit stop for these reductions. And um, again, we, we feel that we have right-sized a lot of the parking to begin with and allowed for reductions in other areas that hopefully uh, projects that uh, maybe uh, that other reductions would be appropriate for that they'll still be able to take advantage of things. But that's that was definitely um, a pretty hot topic, and I imagine still one for a but fair amount of discussion. is that supported by any okay. evidence? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that question. Is that supported by any evidence? I mean, I know that's what people of say, what? but, I mean, does a, does a bus line provide the same kind of benefit as a rail line? No, I, I, I don't know how you can say there's specific evidence one way or another. This is um, largely based on the sentiment of, of, the, of the neighborhoods and the people that we spoke to. I can say Casey and I are both transit users um, from personal experience. You know, I commute in, I get off at North Temple. UTA just removed my two bus lines to get to work every day. And seems like I'm right downtown coming from a really prominent location. And, you know, those were high frequency bus routes and, and, and they're gone. And so I can, ex and, and, you know, my own personal experience, I can see that. So I, you know, I'm a little sympathetic to that sentiment. And at the same time, the city's just invested substantial resources for these high frequency bus routes and putting a lot uh, of faith in them. And I, and I think there's good reason. I think it's, it's a great area for discussion. Yeah, I just wanted to point out that this is gonna be one of those things where adopted city policies and the community feedback we're getting are conflicting. And so that's going to be a point that we're going to expect the planning commission to to consider um, what direction to go with this particular item with the proximity to transit. So Absolutely. Um, I will say along those same lines, there's there's more evidence that shows that that bus ridership um, is similar to rail ridership when the bus line itself is more permanent in nature. It has the infrastructure in place, the bus shelters, the more enhanced kind of stop, those kinds of things where there's been an investment into into the line. It's a lot harder to move it when it's just a, a sign on a post that says bus stop. So um, the city has funded updating, I think, I think four lines, four bus routes um, in the city that are now considered high frequency that weren't just a few weeks ago. Um, and so that's, and part of that is adding in more enhanced bus stops. So if you go up and down 900 South, you're going to start seeing those bus shelters and things like that start appearing. Um, and so that's a question that we're going to have to figure out as a, as a commission. I just think it raises equity issues. I mean, if you're saying, if you're lucky enough to have a transit line, you get that benefit, but for large swaths of the city, that's not available. Thank you. <laughs> that's the argument we've been saying. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's certainly, I mean, I think there's good reason on both sides. So that's certainly one to discuss. Maybe less good reason on some side, but that's okay. Um, valet parking, we've just proposed some new, uh, more clarified criteria with that affordable and senior housing in any of these we can um, Casey can help us go through if you want to go through any of these specific ins and outs of these you've got them um, you have two documents you have the proposed ordinance and then you have a proposed ordinance with notes and that notes has all these footnotes of kind of how we got to what we got to um, anything that we decide we want to discuss a whole bunch fantastic um, we're scheduled for another uh, work session on the 25th. If you want to come back with those questions, I think that would also be appropriate, uh, or you know, provide them with me so I provide them to me so I can come back with additional information. Um, 
with this, we've also uh, the carpool and car share uh, included new standards on that and um, uh, reductions based on those. And then also uh, we have one for a certified parking study demonstrating different needs. And that's, uh, again, kind of this idea maybe of an office where someone comes in and says, we have a, a higher employee count. We have a unique situation for whatever reason as to why we uh, should be required either more or less parking uh, than than what would be there. And we have uh, ways that that would need to be verified uh, by uh, is, transportation engineers and, and by our staff. So. so, Eric, do all these apply to all of the four, five context areas? So, the four context areas. So the... Um, all of them except for the proximity to transit. The proximity to transit would not be necessary, of course, in the transit context because it's already low and we already recognize that. But all of the others, yes, would be um, applicable to any of the other contexts. Thanks. So if you get a parking study that demonstrates you need more parking than what's allowed under the maximum, are you then, is there a process to petition for an increase? Yeah, we can address that specifically. It's not a petition uh, through the Planning Commission. Or a process to there increase is a pro the Yes, maximum. there's a process outlined in there. Like I said, we can either, we can dive into that or explore it next time or and read up that, on it. Is that whatever. an administrative process? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And there are consultants that do certified parking studies? Yes. Yes, yes. definitely. The Transpor thing. Transportation engineers that... Uh, do that, do parking counts and do a thing. peak hours and all, kind, all kinds of things. It's yeah, a thing. absolutely. It's fine. Yep. Probably, yeah. Yep. There's so somebody I that does everything in this world. Follow up on that because we did do, um, the city did do a certain parking study um, that involved downtown and Sugar House. Mm -hmm. It never made it past. For our on desk. street? Was, was that for on street or was Correct. that? Okay. But um, one of the findings in that uh, was the issue of shared parking and I so I want to touch on that a little bit more so I better understand it. So you've changed um, provisions for shared parking based on use but is there anything in there that's incentivizing shared parking because one of the findings in that study um, stated the benefits and the need for like a parking authority which essentially builds upon that idea of shared parking. And it's one of the problems we experience in various spots especially like Ninth and Ninth um, where I own this, nobody else can park here, where we get all those conflicts along for south and people are getting booted and ticketed. So how are we trying to, to uh, increase the benefits to the public, which also then I think help the, the businesses, to um, have more shared parking instead of this, this is my little fiefdom, and if you step foot on it and you don't do what I want you to do, I'm going to ticket you. I think, um, can you explain to me if we have incentives to try to promote that? And if not, then maybe that's something we can um, look at a little bit more. So the, the primary incentive is that when you have multiple uses on a property, you don't need to park the full amount for each of those uses. That's the incentive. Um, it's really challenging for the city to um, basically, and I'm going to say this wrong, but to make it so somebody has to share their parking. You, we can't make one property owner shoulder the burden of another property owner in an area. So if they want to... And that would be a requirement, Nick. I'm just wondering if there right. are ways that and, we can incentivize, hey, if you three property owners work together to share this parking, you're going to get something right. positive for it. I'm not suggesting requiring Yeah, it, and what we do is that's what shared parking and off-site parking is intended to do. So, for example, um, it works really well downtown. Um, it hasn't quite worked as well in other parts of the city, but, um, you know, the city was able to build the Eccles Theater without building a single parking spot because we could share what was around there because it was available. The property owners of the garage were like, yeah, we want people to park in our garage when it's not being used. Otherwise, it's just sitting there vacant. We're not making money. And so 
that's really from a zoning perspective, those are the types of incentives a zoning ordinance can get to. Other than that, it, a zoning ordinance really isn't effective at incentivizing um, behavior. So. Yes. It's, have we done a review of other um, like cities that, that maybe capitalize more on shared parking? I just don't want to pass up all of the work you guys have been doing because this takes so long to not address something that's becoming a problem throughout the city and that maybe there's something more we can do to really look at it, um, knowing that other agencies or other divisions you know, could be part of it. But I don't want to pass that up because... We have looked at those things, and those are in other cities. Those are things that are done outside of a zoning code. So it, that's that parking authority um, viewing parking as more of a utility, those types of things. Um, but they need to be the zoning code itself isn't good at doing that. It's not they're not it's not really set up for that. So there needs to be other mechanisms, and that's that downtown and sugar house parking study that you mm -hmm. referenced um it did identify that i think the city is well aware i think the downtown alliance and the chamber of commerce is well aware of that and i think everybody wants to get there but because a lot of the, the parking is almost all privately owned we need to bring or at least the off street parking we need to bring those property owners and, and operators along with that and that takes a long time and we're not there yet as a city well just a thought, um, when I was in L.A., we, we would do multifamilies. We'd get incentives to do an extra story if we included uh, low-income housing as part of the development. We could replace a lot of that parking with bicycle parking. Would there be a way to incentivize biz business owners by increasing a, by a story or leasable square footage if they include so many public parking spaces within their development? That could be a way of doing it. But If that's, yeah, I mean, we, we can. We can look at that. That's something that we'd have to figure out how to administer and manage. And when you're when you're doing things like that, you're essentially creating, for lack of a better term, a bank that you have to operate, so that you know what's there, who has rights to what. That takes a certain level of staff time and administration to be able to do that. So those are all things that we'd have to consider. One, if we have the ability to even do it as a city, if that's the, the approach we want to take. So. You want to add anything? Okay. Um, I'll just say one other thing uh, that Nick mentioned about the Downtown Alliance, just having met with them a number of times. I know that is something that they are very specifically working on, as well as coming up with um, signage plans and different things and being able to create kind of a, that bank within their own organization to find who has empty parking and to or excess parking and be able to get people to it so yeah i think it's great but not all the other areas that are experiencing trouble have an alliance an outside entity Understood. that has a vested economic interest to drive that right. which then falls on the city yeah um and like nick mentioned the zoning ordinance isn't the perfect place to create those incentives we hope that by hopefully right sizing these, we're increasing property values, we're increasing use, and we're eliminating excess or creating opportunities for things like that, um, that we're hopefully, you know, kind of right-sizing it, so. Um, so with that, next, I wanted to give a brief explanation of the new layout that's in here. Just so as we go through it, we're gonna primarily look at the a handful of the numbers on these context sheets, but if you happen to be referencing the ordinance tonight or at another time, I want you to be able to understand um, this section 040 is the parking counts, the minimum and maximums, and it's the bulk of this ordinance is this large table of all the uses. And so as you'll see here, uh, first column is the land use itself. And so what's been done is all land uses that are used elsewhere in the zoning code are represented here. And they're categorized first by that kind of large top, uh, large level thing here, you know, like residential uses and then the smaller context of household living. Okay, so that's the first column there as you reference things. The next is the minimum parking requirements, and so you'll notice the four contexts, general, neighborhood center, urban center, and transit. So that's gonna, and it lists the zoning designations at the top of the column, and then, uh, of course, those are the minimum um, parking requirements for each of those contexts. 
And then the final column is this uh, maximum parking allowed. Given that there's a whole slew of uses and you may have interest in certain ones, um, and, but in respect to time, I understand, I, I'd like you to be able to look through those. If there are certain ones that stand out, um, we can certainly discuss those at a, at a later time. Um, but what I wanted to do, hopefully, was um, to go to uh, the parking context you have in front of you. And uh, so you've got the transit context there. With that, I've listed a handful of what I felt were maybe the key ones that people kind of wanted to, to discuss that we found. And that's office, retail, restaurant, and then taking a look at, for example, the bike parking. But um, basically what you'll see is um, in the transit context. This is in the table at the bottom of the Yeah, the, the table page. at the bottom. Yeah, thanks. Um, our current ordinance requires a minimum of three per thousand square feet and uh, plus 1.25 per thousand for other floors. That's for the ground floor. And then um, the max, and this was a little hard to do an apples to apples comparison on everything because our current ordinance is all over the board based on zoning designation and whatnot as to what the minimum and maximums are. But I tried to give as best of a representation as possible. We're proposing that in the transit context that there would be no minimums for office uh, uses and that the max would be two per thousand. And that goes a little bit, seems a little contrary to what I said earlier, that the office is requiring more, yet we're setting our new maximum below the old minimum. Um, but again, we want to, we're encouraging structured parking for that and feel that we have the requirements in place for appropriate structures and saying, um, that office use should not spill out and be uh, surface level parking yeah, highlight rates. Yes, yeah, sir. so I was, I was just going to make a follow up comment that one of the reasons behind that is to, if somebody is going to do surface parking lot in our transit area, we don't want it to take up a lot of space. We would rather have the property be taken up by building than by surface parking. So that's why one, another reason why that maximum is kept pretty low. And this is, a, as we go through these, this is a great place to, if we want to debate any numbers, anything like that, that, that would be appropriate. Otherwise, I'll keep rolling through. With retails, again, very similar. Um, we had a minimum of two per thousand, and a max was, again, based on the zoning district, but typically it was fairly low. Um, we're again proposing a minimum, no minimum, and again a maximum of the two per thousand. We're saying these are in a transit area. You should be walking or using transit to get to them. Uh, otherwise, you shouldn't be, same thing, don't take up a lot of space. Build structured parking if you, if you feel you require more than that for uh, retail. Restaurant, a little bit different um, in that uh, we're looking at two per thousand for a minimum and a maximum of five per thousand. And um, felt that those were a little more, in, um, a little more appropriate based on um, the findings that we've searched with other cities and uh, kind of best practices and, and reflect uh, user rates. So are there any questions on those or any other uses that anyone would like to pull out in the transit context? I just want to comment that five per thousand means that the area of the parking lot is the same as the area of the, of the store itself, of the, the restaurant, restaurant itself. So there, you, know, you build the restaurant, you have the same area for parking if you do that. And that's a lot of parking. Is that, know? where did that standard come from? Um, so these numbers, they, honestly, they're a compilation of so many different places. They're from uh, the original accounts. A lot of them came from Clarion in their studies uh, of either other cities, best practices, what they're seeing being implemented, <laughs> parking studies they have uh, for use, use rates. And then also, based on feedback we received as we met with people, they got fine-tuned. Um, I don't know if I can give you, a, on any of these, I don't know if I can give you a direct answer on exact numbers. 
we felt that was a fairly appropriate range. The minimums were a little uncomfortable, the maximums a little uncomfortable. The market hopefully chooses something appropriate in between. But all of these, of course, are open for discussion. Well, I think those areas that suffer from uh, the sp particularly maybe not the transit context, but the areas that seem to suffer the most are actually the um, the small neighborhood business. center. Yeah, the neighborhood yeah. center. Yeah, and you'll context. see the numbers on that. We've the max we've increased based on yeah. we found we were and I think vastly that's reasonable underparked. given given what's going on there. But but when we build these. Um, I mean, when we build these units like this and build this ha the parking like this, there's a couple of problems with the design of the buildings. If you want the transit context wants to be um, a development context where I mean, you're not looking at parking lots, and that's true of all of these sort of higher density places that we're that we're looking at, right? They they don't want to be parking lots, but it's hard to imagine how. If you have a parking lot the same size as the building, you know it can't be sort of a parking forward uh, kind of use, and that definitely would not be appropriate in a transit context. So I'm not quite sure how you're going to administer that if somebody wants to come in with a max. I think it's appropriate that, if we want to discuss a new max number or minimum number on any of these. I think it's a good setting to be able to discuss that and propose a different number or talk about that, I think. Well, I don't know, but... Um, or a recommendation for us to explore it further or something. Yeah. I, I think that's a good... I mean, I'm, I have no problem with the office where you, and, and even the retail where you look at structured parking guests taking up some of that. I don't know why restaurants would be that much different in the transit context because they're you know going to be in buildings that are not just a single restaurant building presumably right right well how would that actually play out like on main street say you open a restaurant in an existing storefront there's no on site so, parking. well, for, so for existing buildings, that's going to be a different story. But if you're talking about a, this, I mean, this is new construction. Well, it's, you're, but if you're a new use. But you're a permitted use, and so it's only if it's changing uh, something that's pushing into a, you know, a, a higher parking context type thing. So, it, not necessarily if you know if if the office that was there or whatever that was there, the retail spot that was there was permitted at a certain level. But, it's if, not but necessarily if you're reusing a building true. that wasn't necessarily a restaurant as a restaurant, it would say it was a warehouse. I don't know. I'm just coming up with something and there's no parking anywhere in the vicinity. Like how do you deal with, I guess reuse generally. So in the transit context, there's no minimum. So, there is a, well, there, there is, is a on restaurant. Restaurant, restaurant has two per thousand. Restaurant has two per two thousand. thousand minimum. Which is, that's what I'm saying I have a problem with. And so we need to make sure our ordinance matches that because I'm but looking not. at the ordinance and it, maybe I'm looking at the wrong one, but in the transit context for restaurant, brew pub, taverns, it says no minimum. And this was opened, I think, from the Dropbox. Final draft with footnotes. Current right now, it's current, not proposed. So currently, the restaurants have no minimum in a lot of these, right? No min. Okay, I apologize. We have got an error on here. It's the only one in the whole ordinance, so this is good. I'm <laughs> glad we found it up front because there are no others. I can guarantee that. So, okay. So, um, yeah, so there is no, thank you, Nick. There's no minimum, so something could come in as a reuse without requiring any parking. That's, okay. that part of it would be solved. Okay. But if there's further discussion on the maximum, we could certainly discuss that. So, just to 
We've been talking for about 40 minutes, mm -hmm. and I just want to make sure, you know, if there's something specific we want to cover before, as Eric is moving through here, let's make sure we do that. But let's, uh, I just want to keep this going. Sure. Okay, okay. absolutely. And just so we are going to be skip, we broke this into pieces, so okay. we will be Because we back. are coming back to this, yeah. right? With other yeah. things. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, so when, when yeah. you're done, let us know, and we yeah, can please. end. I'm just watching my and, fellow commissioners, and yep. I'm seeing them in and out. So. And we still need to, before everybody <laughs> leaves, we need to vote I on know. chair and vice so, okay. chair. So if you, if you guys are done, we are more than comfortable stopping and resuming this how, how at, a, feel? at a later meeting when we have some time. <laughs> I, I'll give some quick comments. <laughs> I mean, I'm waiting to kind of see how we your, just stay your complete here presentation and, we'll just and leave give you all of our, um, you know, no, no, no. I mean, uh, we'll go a few more minutes. One, like, um, just to put on the table, and I've said this before, I have utterly no concept of what one per 1,000 or two per, it's really challenging for me to even compare and think this in that sort of way. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I know I have an office. I have two. I have two thousand square feet. I have six to eight people that work there. That's about all I. And we all drive cars. And so, like, that's all. Like, that's my only comparable deal. Um, but, so, a couple of things I always want to give in, and say that one, I'm, I'm less concerned about minimums in, or even maximums, arguably in downtown areas, because I feel as long well, the problems we want to prevent other things that are outside of parking, right? So surface parking lots so it seems like zoning and other things can do that and we, it should and it seems like the market then is going to dictate minimums and maximums these developers are going to build what they need to build because they're putting millions of dollars into it so they need to make sure that it's going to work financially right to me i think the bigger problem the one that we deal with here is a body more frequently are quite frankly like the guy that came here in front of us today when i have some real challenges to think if that business is going to be successful the way that that guy's building it out like one, it's right there on seventh on seventh east. No one's gonna want to sit on that patio and have dinner, regardless of how nice he thinks he can make it. And and the with parking there, there's no parking along. This is so minimum. He's gonna run that time getting people there. I mean, but he's building it, and that's what they're doing, and that's it's gonna be a problem. I think you know same thing with over on ninth and ninth where the condos got built. It's kind of these small to mid sized developers that are. <laughs> less sophisticated, I guess, to understand their market where they're using in their China, you know, and that's where we have problems in the, in the deal. And I think where, where those really, and I, and I, and I even think about politically about how you move this thing through grouping the whole city in, in a general context, um, is hard to understand. I think, I think it's almost to be easier if you did have a way that you had general context because I mean Redwood Road and State Street and arguably 7th East and everything are a little bit different than running things around you know through the avenues or through Rose Park or through these neighborhoods right I mean the neighborhood impact is just different that's where you're going to have people and I think and maybe it's the same and it works out the same but like politically I think for people to see their neighborhood tied in with these at least for me too because you're, it's hard to, to understand and be like did you think about this in context of a neighborhood versus in context of an industrial area um, so that's my, I guess, my feedback in that sense, is it ways to articulate more clearly that when you're, you know, it's really, it's not the neighborhood centers that matter, it's what's around them that matters. You know what I mean? It's not that, it's not that actual parcel, it's what's around them that's the impact that's external. And so I think figuring out how we better articulate that and spell it out is going to be helpful, both in me understanding what you're proposing and also curating a shorter meeting when, when when the public comes here to present yeah absolutely this is like 20 hundred comments is like just like standard run-of-the-mill stuff right that's what we get for everything it seems like a lot of public input so i imagine we're going to some no 2800 emails that went yeah. out oh went out yeah very few came back but the, yes <laughs> really at 20 out of all this no, all right and again and, and the vast majority was this is fantastic we're supportive of it yeah 2800 went okay. out so my, anyway, so my sense of these large-scale developments, the market's going to dictate it. What we want to stop are service parking lots, and the more that we can prevent that, the better. Okay, um, Eric, I think we should Can give I give us, a little response to him real yeah, fast? Yeah, oh, please, please, okay. please. And then the other thing I'm going to want is, since we are meeting again, mm -hmm. let us know, let us dive into this a little more now that we've heard from you so we know what kind of feedback to come back with at, at the next yeah. meeting. 
Fantastic. Okay, so and they kind of go hand in hand. So these context sheets are going to be very beneficial to you. What you'll find out, of course, like we said, this neighborhood center is the most complex situations possible. Okay, that's the that's the real challenging one. The general context, rather than thinking of as all lumping in together, think of it as the least change from the current ordinance. And that each of those are still dealt with by use and that we hopefully have addressed those appropriately and that people are generally comfortable with how things are. So we'll kind of look at those. Um, look at those numbers, look at any of the alternatives and things like that. Honestly, this is the parking context is kind of the meat and potatoes of this discussion. I mean, we're, I would say we're well over halfway through this. The next part, we look at more specifically about some of the residential counts that's kind of a hot topic as well. After that, it's a real super fast report on kind of what we did in the other sections that are largely cleanup items. So it's really just getting a feel, are you comfortable with kind of where this sets us? Is there something else we should be considering? Are we, um, you know, and I understand, I appreciate the comment of what does two per thousand mean? Those are hard. They've been studied. They've been, um, you know, a lot of people have looked at these and they're based off of a lot of studies and industry standards and, uh, and things like that. And I understand they don't mean a whole lot to the general public, but to the developers and things like that, they absolutely know that they can report to you exactly what their market needs. Yeah, so. I would just like to say, I'd like to see some incentive um, for, in terms of environmental best practices, to promote alternative um, surfaces from asphalt, because we allow it in the code, um, but we don't, if we're talking about reducing heat islands and we're talking about imperme you know, permeable surfaces, I'd like to see some, a little bit more language related to that. One thing on that topic, just real quick, um, our sustainability department is actually working on a sustainable code initiative right now that will address a lot of those things um, that will impact the zoning ordinance. So it may not be through this, but there will be some things. I think the consultant that they've hired has given a first kind of list of things to potentially include. And I know that heat island and stormwater retention, detention are both on that on list. That. So I hope that doesn't end up in a drawer like the last sustainability code review. From well, most of so the last ago. sustainability code review actually got implemented in the code, so it didn't stay in a drawer. <laughs> Another thing we kind of look at that with that, I mean, the scope of this project is it, it didn't focus on that as much, and I'll even bring up at the end of this, I, we kind of identified through this project what we think are some potential next steps or some, some other opportunities beyond this that maybe we should consider. And that's, that's absolutely one that we'll talk about. So Yeah, that would be, that would be good to articulate, actually. Yeah, yeah, and I've got it in a slide here that we can, we'll talk about. So. Right. And you're coming back next time. 25th. 25th. Yep. Okay. Any other follow-ups for Eric tonight? Would it be appropriate if there's any specific questions, can they be emailed to me directly and things like that or something or other? Or does it need to be talked about tonight? Or is no, that, that's fine. Absolutely. Okay. We'll just make so, sure that we let everybody know what questions were asked. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I think yeah. that'd be good. If there's something you want me to explore, I probably am not gonna, I'm not going to respond to you directly. Obviously, I'm going to wait till a public setting. But um, please, if you have suggestions you want me to be prepared with, let me know. Okay. I, and I understand this was a is a huge document to try to digest. So I've tried to. And set you that should table, know so. we really appreciate the work that's gone into this and and your presentation. So I don't mean to right. diminish it at all. You're really tremendous. I just want to give it the attention it deserves. So thank you. Thank. You. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you for that. Then, the last item is election of a new chair and vice chair and I've been getting all the emails all the campaigns from the campaigns uh, the last few weeks I'm sure everybody has um, so how do we want to go forward with this nominations any nominations 
For anyone that's Weston. interested that would like to Weston, declare Weston, do you have interest. a nomination? Um, <laughs> I would like to nominate Adrian as chair. As chair. I'll second that. Okay. Is there anybody else that would like to make a nomination? I would like to nominate Amy, Amy as vice chair. Okay. Let's do, uh, let's do chair first, and then we'll do vice chair. Okay, thank you. So is there another nomination for chair? Well, that looks like no. So I, do we officially vote? All in favor? Do we, can we do it unanimous? I mean, can we do it verbally, or do we have to? Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Looks like Adrian is our next chair. And the and then vice chair. Do you want to make your nomination again? Mm -hmm. Madam Chairman, I'd like to nominate Amy as vice chair for Eight. the upcoming year. That's number one. Do we have any other? Oh, I need a second on that. Don't I? Yes. Second. From John. Second from John. Uh, I have a nomination for Brenda to be sec or vice chair. And Brenda, do we have a, a second for that? Contest vice chair. I'll second. Okay, Matt. All right. So I guess we need to go one at a time. How do we do? No, we have, we better do it anonymously. <laughs> uh, you can do it either way. It's been a while since we've actually done a, a secret ballot, um, but. Um, in, in my experience, it's always we, we been. Haven't had, we haven't had a contested yeah. uh, vote in a while. So, um, I am happy to withdraw. <laughs> Just make me happy. Awesome. I think, Carolyn, though, that was very kind of you, but I'm more than happy. Are to, you sure? Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. Is there. Making that easy. Then uh, is there. A, I got to leave it open for one more second and another nomination. Looks like no, so let's do this by acclamation. All in favor of uh, Brenda as vice chair, say aye. 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 And, set, and opposed? It's unanimous. There you go. <laughs> Thanks, ladies. <laughs> <laughs>